All right, good afternoon, everybody. Please take a seat. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to all the students who are visiting the uh, Water Resources uh, Science Graduate Program. Hope you're having a good visit, and um, we hope you meet a lot of great, great people who you're interested in working with. Um, today's speaker is uh, Jim Stark. And he retired in May of 2017 from the USGS, from the Water Science Center in Moundsview. Uh, he served nine years as the director of that facility. And before that, he worked for 30 years for the USGS in various capacities. He was a studies chief, lead of the National Water Quality Assessment uh, of the Upper Mississippi Project, a groundwater specialist, and a project chief. And before coming to Minnesota, he was working with USGS in other capacities in Utah and, and Michigan. Um, he has a bachelor's degree uh, from UMD. He has two master's degree, one in geology and one in water resources from the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> and he has an MBA from the University of St. Thomas. Uh, Jim was hired in uh, March 2018, after he retired from USGS, to work as the director of the Legislative Water Commission, which reviews water policy and reports and makes recommendations to assist the legislature in formulating water-related legislation. And a number of us uh, last year participated in sessions that he organized where, you know, he uh, laid out a whole range of different <coughs> topic areas and asked for input on what might make a good legislative request. So we're eager to hear what came out of that process and what kinds of things you actually recommended to the legislature. Let's welcome Jim. Thank you. I'm wondering if you have time for the visitors to introduce themselves. That'd be, sure, if you want that'd to be go through that, interesting, that'd be interesting, I think. Yeah. Would uh, the visitors like to just start? Uh, I guess you're the ones with the name tags, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we we'll just start here and go. Yeah, I want to know what his name. Is. Just your name and like your where did you where did you come from? And... My name is Alyssa. I came from Madison. I'm Liz Milchek, and I work in the state right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Will Lund, I'm a graduate of ESPM program here, and I currently work for the USGS facility. I'm Linnea Rock. I'm from Madison. <clears throat> I'm Megan, I'm from Central Wisconsin. I'm Josh, I'm from Chicago. I'm Mitch, I'm from the University of Minnesota. I'm Logan, I'm from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Um, <coughs> Amanda, so. uh, I'm Amanda, and I was the same question. Where, 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 where is your biggest feeling? Oh, I'm McGill. Okay. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I'm Jamie. <coughs> I'm um, previously one of the University of Michigan, but I live in Olympia. Um, I'm David. I uh, get ready and I'm the to Indiana University. <clears throat> one more. I mean, for one from Vermont, I went to Indiana. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm So you're all visiting here, <clears throat> contemplating grad school. Is that yeah. is that why they're here? Yeah. Oh, great, great. Although I'm a Badger, mostly. Um, this is a great place to be. So, uh, so good luck. I hope it works out well for you. Um, I'm also glad to see you have beer here, and uh, um, that's something that uh, that was pretty common in the, I'm with the grad department I went to in Madison. So glad to see Minnesota has picked up on that now. That's maybe a little legal. I'll I'll just pass these out. Um, this is the briefest form of what I'm going to talk about today. See if you can see yourself. Okay. Good enough. So I would like to talk today about uh, science in the legislative process and, uh, and what you, whether or not you think that works and how that works. Um, the Legislative Water Commission, these are the uh, statutory responsibilities for the Water Commission. And uh, probably the one in bold or the one that 
involves making recommendations to the legislature for bills that might get passed is probably the more important one. <clears throat> and although these are the statutory responsibilities, what, what the job really involves is working um, between uh, the legislative body and the state agencies, uh, the university, the not-for-profit organizations, and the federal agencies uh, to try to understand what our priorities are. And, and that, uh, that kind of liaison between the legislature and the agencies isn't very strong sometimes. There are a lot of walls between those parts of, of government. So um, a lot of the work is done behind the scenes. So the commission actually is made up of 12 members. Um, it's an, kind of an interesting commission in that it consists of six members from the House of Representatives and six members from the Senate, six members who are from the Republican Party and six who are from the DFL party here in Minnesota. Um, so we call it DFL here in Minnesota. Maybe an unfamiliar term to some of you. So that's interesting in that they're split between the bodies of the legislature. They're split between the parties, and that's that's actually very unusual. The committees, of course, are all <clears throat> dominated and controlled by the party in in power. This is very different from that. So <clears throat> it makes I think I think it makes for a really good organization um, because of that mix. These are uh, the members. Um, that are shown here. Maybe you recognize some of them. The chairs um, have been Representative Paul Torkelson, who is a, a, a farmer from southwestern Minnesota, um, and then Senator Chuck Weger, who's a, a Maplewood senator, so a city senator and a, a, a agricultural representative. They've just changed. Uh, now the, the chairs are Senator Bill Weber, who is from far southwestern Minnesota, and Representative Peter Fisher, who <clears throat> um, is in the White Bear Lake area. So he really became involved in the commission because of White Bear Lake, but now has, has, a, has a chair in one of the other committees. <clears throat> so I've been the director for about 10 months now, so I'm still kind of learning. Um, previous to that, I worked for the USGS I started, um, they, I got dropped into this position in the middle. So we're under, for those of you who are unaware, the Minnesota legislature is in session now. It goes from first of the year until about May. Um, last year, I got dropped into the middle of that without really knowing what, what I was doing. I still don't, but I know more than I did then. <clears throat> um, so it was, it's been a real learning experience actually for me. Um, now, more than a year later, I have a little bit of perspective on how things work, and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that later. So there, there are 13 recommendations um, that are progressing now from a process we had over the summer into bills. And uh, those bills move <clears throat> into the House and into the Senate. They have to have sponsors in each body. And then they have to have bills that are similar, or they get they get um, modified in conference committees. So it's it's a long process. Um, there has to be a sponsor. The House here in Minnesota is now controlled by the Democratic Party. Um, <clears throat> the Senate is controlled by the Republican Party. So there's some tension there. Um, these bills there are there are uh, so the session started the first of January. There are about 1,500 bills in each house now. So if you can imagine that process, just trying to keep track of all that, there, there are probably about 100 uh, in each body that relate to water. So I've tried to look at those and figure out which ones are water related and try to track those. So you can imagine that the length of time any one representative or senator has to focus on a bill is really small. And they have to, they have a very broad perspective on things. So. So my role is trying to try to coach, coach and coach that process along. So these are the 13 recommendations. I'm talking a little bit about how we got there. And uh, I don't know that this is, I don't think this has been the usual process for the commission, <clears throat> which is about five years old, um, but there wasn't any um, game plan when I came in. So um, we went through a process over the summer 
within the commission. And, and in, in fact, the commission members, after the session's over, they're pretty much gone. They've gone back to their jobs or to whatever they do, to their farms, to their jobs, and and <clears throat> they, you don't have much time with them. So um, a lot of the time over the summer was spent looking at reports um, that have been done over about the last 20 years and trying to understand what the most important water issues were in Minnesota, trying to pull specific suggestions out of those reports. One example, and probably the best example that I have and have used is the sustainability framework that was done at the university, at the Water Resources Center here about a decade ago. Um, it, uh, it probably does the best job, if you want to refer to something, of assessing the needs and priorities in the state. It's a really good document. <clears throat> there were many people involved in that process. Um, and at the report of, for that work is really very good. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I think when it was released, uh, it just so happened that the, the party in control flopped about that time. And, and that report never really got the um, traction that it should have, in my opinion. But <clears throat> that's really a found, one of the primary foundations for where we're going. So <clears throat> based on a review of those reports, um, we put together a set of what we thought were the most important recommendations for water issues within the state. Um, there are about 100 of them that came out of probably, you know, 500 things that you could glean from those documents. And then we began a stakeholder process to try to get input on those and prioritize those. We held we had six broad issues and about 100 recommendations, and we held five meetings over the summer with each with different sets of stakeholders who had different interests to try to talk about those and kind of synthesize those and, and prioritize them. And we did that and, and narrowed that list down to about 25. <clears throat> then we followed that up with a, a survey process, an online survey process that went out to about 450 individuals around the state who gave us some feedback on, on those recommendations. And that was a that was a good process. Um, in in fact, we learned that uh, the thing we went through with the stakeholder process was really very good, and, and it really confirmed what we were told in those meetings. Uh, nonetheless, it helped us prioritize those, and rank them, and come up with these thirteen recommendations. So I'll just spend a little bit of time on each of them. I I will say this: some of these are um, some of these are things that are kind of minor tweaks to legislation. Some of them are more broad ranging and long term. So there's a mixture of, of the scope of each one of these recommendations. <clears throat> and I'll just talk, these I think, you know, really do represent some of the issues that are most important in the state, or at least most important with respect to those that have um, the political will to move forward. Uh, one of them that is, is called inflow and infiltration, and that involves uh, leaking wastewater lines throughout our cities. And, and uh, our infrastructure for wastewater and it is really old in Minnesota. And water leaks into those pipes, those wastewater pipes, and in some cases leaks out because of the age of the pipes, because of things like climate change, which has resulted in more rainfall, higher water tables, submerged some of those those pipes. And that that flow, that fresh water, if you will, ends up in our wastewater systems and has to be treated. So it's a it's a big expense. It means that the wastewater systems have to increase their capacity and the cost of treating that. So so there's uh it's a big problem. It's a costly problem and one you probably don't think about very much. But, but I know just in the little sphere of people I know, there are at least two friends of ours who have had in the last year problems with their the connection between their homes and the wastewater system. So um, there's some legislation that's needed to allow the sanitary districts in the state to use the monies they have to help address the private connections. So they've, they've, they really have a process of upgrading the wastewater systems that exist that are owned by the cities and by the sanitary districts 
which involve many cities, but there isn't a good way to address and help out people who have that problem in their home. So if you're retired on a fixed income, um, there's a leak in the, the lateral that connects your house to the water main, it may be a $10,000 repair. Many people just can't afford that. So this legislation would address that. <clears throat> the wastewater infrastructure is a gigantic issue in Minnesota. And we don't probably hear a lot about that, but it's a it's a very major problem and a very costly problem. There is an, an, at least one estimate that says there's about a $5 billion um, unfunded mandate out there that needs to be used to address $5 billion. We could maybe not build something else for that, but um, but uh, on the pond that <laughs> maybe not a wall, but in the context of a wall, so it's a wall, it's a wall sized problem that we have um, that needs to be addressed in, in this state. So the state needs legislation to increase the general obligation bonding that they um, have allocated to those issues and to find ways for um, cities to cooperate so that one of the major problems is with small cities. Uh, the metro area here has a lot of resources and they have they have means to address those problems but in our small cities and towns and those are primarily ones under 5,000 people. Uh, a lot of those communities in Minnesota are mostly they're in greater Minnesota. Their populations are aging. Their tax base is not growing. And they just don't have the, the financial resources to, to fix those structures, um, their wastewater plants, their drinking water plants and to manage the new water quality regulations that come out. So it's a gigantic problem. It's primarily in our small cities, um, and it's one that all of the agencies really need to try to address. Um, this is an example, just a little tweak to some legislation. So um, <clears throat> the wastewater um, standards, those that aren't promulgated by the federal government, some of them are, are come through the state um, and they change frequently. And, and there's a process that is enabled within those that are mandated by the EPA to get peer review, to get outside review and comment, and to try to make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that those are sound scientifically. In the, in the state, um, that process has gone on um, through what's called the commissioner's order. So the commissioner of the pollution control agency has said, this is the process we're gonna follow it's going to be similar to the EPA process, but it is in fact just a state process. And that's worked really well, um, but it, it is in, in state government, a commissioner's order, which lapses uh, with changes in government and a new commissioner. So we have a new commissioner of the PCA now. So, so that order would either have to be reinstated um, or it would lapse. So this, this legislation just it involves um, putting that into statute so that as administrations change, um, that kind of process would go on. <clears throat> you probably all know about our overuse of, of sodium chloride for road de-icing. And it's applied all over the state. Um, it degrades, I think, particularly in the metro area, we know it's degrading our streams, our wetlands and our lakes. Um, there's no good fix for that. So. Um, reverse osmosis may be um, one of the mechanisms to fix that. That's probably not very realistic uh, in our water bodies. So I, you know, I think here in the state, the, the Department of Transportation, um, the cities have done really a pretty good job of reducing the chloride volume that they put on our roads. If you, if you live here, you know that in some cities, you see these, these lines that go down the street, which are pre-application of uh, sodium chloride solution that they can put on and really reduces the the mass of sodium chloride that goes on our roads. So in the in the municipal world, in the state world, maybe not on the freeways, but in many of our roads, they've really done a good job of reducing that. Uh, however, a big problem, but a third of the problem comes from um, shopping centers and churches and schools and uh, corporations that spread salt on through commercial applicators um, in excess amount. So sodium chloride is cheap. 
um, you, you often see it's more like an aggregate on the ice than it is a de-icer. So there's uh, about a third of the loading problem in the in the state comes from commercial applicators. There's been training that has gone on by the PCA for metropolitan applicators to to try to help them understand the proper application rates. <clears throat> That's been really successful. That's been funded by the US EPA. Those funds are going away. So this is a bill that would just uh, move that responsibility to the general fund in the state government. And then one additional part is, is a part of the bill which would limit the liability that applicators have when somebody falls. Um, both the applicator and the commercial en entity when someone falls down. So um, if they're trained, if they're certified, if they're applying um, the icers at, at the proper amount and somebody falls down, they wouldn't be sued. The liability would be less than it would be under other cases. <clears throat> uh, the Legislative Water Commission is going to sunset. So uh, many of these commissions, when when uh, they're enabled, have a sunset date. Um, the commission since had a five-year sunset. It ends in July 1. Uh, so unless there's an active bill that moves through both houses and is signed, uh, the commission will go away. Uh, and so that's just one little thing that we need to deal with. Uh, water sustainability is another issue. This is really a groundwater issue. Um, we've, we've done a lot. For those of you who don't live here, um, Minnesota has a, um, an amendment to the Constitution which increased the sales tax. Those funds are used for the environment, uh, for cultural activities, and, uh, and for habitat work in the state. So that's been a great, a great benefit. It's done a lot for Minnesota, but at the same time, um, the dollars from the general fund for the state for the environment have slipped as a result. So that's a concern. Um, this is focused on groundwater sustainability. Do we have water for the future? Uh, there's a program called the County Atlas Program here, kind of unique to Minnesota for those of you who don't live here, that marches across the state and maps the, the, the geology and the hydrology of the state in a, in a progressive and systematic method. Uh, they're about half done. The Minnesota Geological Survey and the DNR are doing that work. Um, it's a, a great resource, and um, this would provide funds to ensure that that continues, but in addition, I uh, would put some additional emphasis on understanding groundwater and surface water interactions and understanding water budgets. So um, one of the things in my mind that the County Atlas program lacks is understanding of, of our, the, the flow through our, our hydrologic systems. Um, how much we have in storage, how, what the flow through that system is, how much we can use without degrading to a greater extent our streams and our lakes. And so there are ways to, to estimate those amounts, and that would be a component that would be added into the ATLAS work, um, probably in, in a county, probably as a pilot, but then also in one of the, in Minnesota, the the um, the push has been to move implementation of actions to improve water to local entities, and that's called one watershed, one plan. So it's at a watershed level. Um, there's there's really movement now to move beyond assessment and and monitoring and move more toward uh, implementation <clears throat> within watersheds controlled for the most part by those local organizations. So one of these pilots would probably be in a county, one would be in a watershed uh, where that unit, the watershed unit makes more sense. <clears throat> uh, another issue are lakes, uh, preserving and protecting our lakes. So um, <clears throat> in Minnesota, the, our lakes are a really prized and important resource and they're threatened in, uh, a number of ways, climate change being one, invasive species, uh, changes in land use, all are provide threats to our lakes. Um, we have a lot of them, and we probably can't implement programs to preserve and protect them all. So 
um, this would be really a pilot effort to um, to assess where we are and to try to determine a path forward and to prioritize lakes uh, so that we would know <clears throat> where things like conservation easements in watersheds could best be applied to preserve and protect the lakes that are most important. Now, that being said, every major lake is the most important lake. So, so politically, that's a really diff that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, but this is uh, an effort which uh, has already hit some resistance, and I don't know how it's going to work in the legislature because if it doesn't do something to Palsley, uh, it may not get that vote. So, so it's it's a little contentious. We'll see if if um, that can move forward. Really, it would prepare a. Uh, in, within the next biennium, prepare a plan for things that would be implemented beyond that. Uh, source water protection for drinking water is a, another issue. Uh, I, I think the Department of Health here in Minnesota does a really good job of of uh, protecting source waters for um, public supply wells from groundwater. There's a program, it's good, it's implemented uh, across the state in most of the public supply uh, wells that supply water to cities and towns. It's a good program, but beyond that, um, people who, about a, um, a third of the residents of the state use um, private domestic wells for their source of water. Some of those are, many of those are impacted by, by high nitrate levels. Um, there is no similar kind of program to try to identify what are the most vulnerable aquifers that are used by most people who use private wells. Uh, how are those, what are the conditions of the waters in those wells and what might we do about that? So it would probably look something like a source water protection program um, in, uh, in townships. So a uh, very different kind of animal than a city controlling the land use around their, their wellhead. This would be over a much broader area and a political entity, something like a township. The Department of Agriculture actually has has a really good first step at this. That they've identified uh, the most vulnerable um, townships in Minnesota based on nitrate susceptibility. Uh, so using that and where people people are using that water to the greatest extent. Um, would be a really good would be the first step and then and then from that there would have to be an enabling legislation to allow something like a township to regulate in some way land use and that probably means cover crops of some kind in certain areas so um, and then in addition uh, our rivers and lakes that provide drinking water such as the water here which comes out of the Mississippi River um, there's very there's no parallel program to wellhead protection in place for rivers. So, and it's a, actually a much more difficult problem because um, the watershed of the Mississippi upstream of of um, the Twin Cities is very large. So, so many different political entities very much very much harder to regulate that. There's another bill going through the House right now that would assess the condition of a broad suite of unregulated compounds, so pesticides, NDMA, things like that, that, that aren't regulated, but we know are there. We don't understand, of course, the, how those mixtures affect our waters, but that, that's one part of this. This would, this would really be an effort to implement uh, um, real-time monitoring in the rivers upstream of those intakes. So probably at two places, uh, where could we implement monitoring that would be real time in nature as a as a first alert for big cities that use the rivers. This this is a minor tweak, but there is for those of you who pay a water bill um, and, and are connected to a city, you pay a fee of about six dollars a year, uh, and that six dollars goes ultimately from the city or the municipality to the health department, they use that to try to uh, assess and remediate and understand um, conditions in public supply, like the best example is lead. So um, you're all probably familiar with Flint. 
um, to ensure that we don't have a situation like Flint, Michigan here in Minnesota. There's lead in, in the connections of most between the uh, municipal lines in the town city and the houses in most cities. There's a lead service connection there that that brings those two pipes together so that they don't uh, they don't heave in the frost. That's all of those old ones have lead in them. And and um, so this um, fee is used to try to to assess and remediate some of those conditions. It's six bucks a year, um, and um, and the proposal it hasn't changed for 15 years. And the proposal in house, which they've been unsuccessful getting increased for 15 years, I believe, would just move that to nine dollars. So it's a relatively small issue, but it's can be a large one when when enough people aren't happy with it. Um, statewide water policy. This is really a, uh, involves a climate change initiative. This is a long-term effort. Uh, we we really need to think about the uncertain future that we're facing with respect to water. We know that droughts are more frequent, floods are more frequent, high intensity, or the intensity of a rainfall is changing. That all affects um, our lakes and streams and infrastructures. You, I think you only <clears throat> need to look at the number of 100 year floods that we've had in the last 10 years in the state and the number of droughts we've had sometimes in the same years to understand that things are changing uh, this is an attempt at least to um, have to develop in the initial part of a plan to adapt uh, and to harden our infrastructure for those things that we know are probably going to change. So the longer term effort um, and we will see how that moves forward. <clears throat> this is one that probably strikes close to home here at the university. Um, Healthy soil really improves water. And I think we all know that. Um, so if we can improve the health of our soil across the agricultural landscapes of Minnesota, there'll be benefits to our water. Uh, the university here has a new position. Anna Case, I believe her name is, uh, who, who has, uh, uh, has started as the state's, as the university's soil health expert. Uh, the funds for that position, as I understand, are, are clean water funds um, and therefore a biennium. So, so that's a great start, but it doesn't ensure that that program will continue. So <clears throat> this bill would really uh, recognize the need to continue that funding on a long-term basis and then to also begin to develop a soil health plan for the state of Minnesota and begin a way to implement that through uh, outreach and extension across the state. So several components that all um, evolving around soil health. Some of the details. Um, this is a water retention issue and it's one of the more complicated of the, of the issues, but we, I think everyone recognizes that if we can slow runoff down, keep water on the land, that it benefits our water resources and benefits agriculture if it's done right. <clears throat> so it would it would expand really the work that the Board of Water and Soil Resources are doing, um, the university is doing, and the Department of Agriculture in, in really finding and tuning uh, the best management practices that we have in the right places so they do the most good. And it's a multi um, many facets to this particular bill, but they're all focused on on, on really um, best management practices in tuning those to the right places through the work that are being done by the agencies. Some of the details. So um, that is a kind of flyover of where we are uh, in this process. Um, again, it, it's based on work that's been done by others throughout the last 20 years um, by discussions of the commission members. Um, a lot of discussions with the, the state agencies here, the stakeholder work, workshops and that survey that I mentioned. And then finally that reached consensus by the commission members. So they, after all was said and done, they, they reached consensus on moving these forward. So there are, um, 
Oh, so it, you know, kind of the goals of these all center around providing clean and sustainable water, protecting and improving our waters, and then preparing for the future. I think, you know, I think they represent the, a consensus of most of the experts in the state. Um, they are, that being said, bipartisan in nature. So these are things that, that uh, members of both parties can generally agree on. Uh, otherwise, if these won't move forward, um, they they focus really on cent on incentives, uh, providing incentive incentives to people rather than trying to regulate them, um, and and changes small changes for the most part to the work that the agencies already are doing, um, with relatively little budget impact. So they're not big ticket endeavors. They're relatively small with respect to their impact to the state's budgets and really um, our first steps and pilot programs for the most part, which may lead to bigger things. And some of these, a few of these are kind of long reaches for long-term things that I, as a state, I think we need to be thinking about if we can, if the legislature can think in those kind of terms. So it's not the world they live in, I, I know that. So um, so let's see. Okay. Let me go back to that one and see. Yeah, I think I've talked about these. So, so they're really things that the legislative body has to be able to agree on. A little bit about, about me and what I did. So, so I spent most of my career in the USGS. Um, it was created over 100 years ago. Um, it's, it's the largest earth science agency in the United States. And, and it's based on really impartial science, objective science, uh, without being influenced by politics, at least maybe for the most of its, most of its period of existence. Some of that I think has changed a bit. Um, and it, it really focuses on working with standard pro protocols and methods across whole country um, with the emphasis on peer review and open and release of publications. Um, as a director there, really what I did was kind of really understood the program in its entirety, worked on funding and staffing and program development and publications. My boss at, at, when I was with the USGS was 800 miles away, so that was good most of the time. <laughs> However, the USGS has a lot of constraints in the way they do things, protocols, methods, publications, review, sometimes to their detriment. Um, but for the most part, I think that's beneficial. So um, the, the, uh, as a legislative commission member, um, it's a non-political position in a very political world. So if you can imagine how that works, um, it's, 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 it's not easy. You, and I, I served there, I'm not a state employee, I served at the pleasure of the, of the commission. So <clears throat> when I, my list of things I did wrong grow to some point, um, I, I will hear about that. Um, there really is no, there hasn't been any instruction manual for this job, but I, I just sort of got dropped in and it's, it's um, politicians are very busy people and the people on this commission have all kinds of other things to worry about. So it's very difficult to communicate with them and to, to really get them to, to uh, focus on what you're doing. All of, almost all of them are not non-scientists. So, so you have to change uh, how you communicate with them because um, one of Paul's peer reviewed journal articles, um, you know, maybe if I can extract the abstract onto a sentence or two, that they may read that. But, um, but that's the world they live in and, and the environment you have to work in. Uh, I really find them, I'm the, the House and the Senate in, in state government here, um, don't communicate all that well. They don't talk to each other. They seldom go between their buildings. Um, that's something I didn't totally understand, I guess, when they began, but, but they're different worlds. And, uh, and you have to communicate between those two bodies. And then particularly between what the commission is trying to do and uh, what the agencies are trying to do. And there, there are, there are barriers there too in communication, particularly now the new governor and uh, um, 
there was after the election comments on these recommendations from the agencies are very hard to find because they didn't know how the governor's budget was going to <clears throat> direct the work of their agency. So, so the, the door kind of shut. Um, and now I think the budget is going to be released on Tuesday. So now the agency folks will know what their budgetary uh, obligations and resources are and we'll be able to comment more on these. And then finally, the audit commission doesn't have any funding. So, so we have nothing in terms of dollars to offer. Um, it's only through legislation that, um, and and within the legislature, it's only bills that make make a difference. And the legislature could, you know, they don't direct the state agencies to do anything. Um, they they either endorse the governor's budget or fund an initiative, but there's no management there between the legislature and the agencies. And and if you want to have something done, it has to be done in the bill. And so that's it, I think. Thank you. Questions? Um, so you said that on um, July 1st, if it's not funded again, the committee or the commission will be like kind of dissolved or something mm -hmm. like that. Is that what you said? Yeah, the commission is dissolved and and I go fishing, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think. if um how like how long can this commission like be approved for it? And can they like be like, hey, we want this to last for twenty years, or how exactly mm. does that work? It's it, whatever the two houses want to do. Okay. Yeah, you know, they do what they want, and they have a lot of authority. So there's a sunset. Uh, there are two bills now. One is for a five-year sunset. The other one's for continue to removing the sunset. They're different in the two houses. Um, my guess would be there'll be there'll be a sunset. And I think, and frankly, I think these commissions it's appropriate for them to sunset because if they're not doing anything, um, they shouldn't be enabled, you know, uh, to continue without any results. So, so I think that's okay. It just creates a little stress. And the previous director, I think, um, left the just for that reason. She she went to to a state agency, and I think the the in under previous control of the House and Senate, there was a bill every year to just get rid of some of these commissions, and and uh, that's a that's a stressful world to live in. So, sorry. You mentioned the prioritization of lakes. Um, I think that in, in the context of inheritance and designating inheritance, is there really, would there really be a uh, an interest in actually prioritizing? Uh, because that's a, I mean, that's, that was done, I guess, in Wisconsin about 10 years ago, or maybe more than that. Um, but, you know, it, it, that, like you said, you know, if your, your, your priority lake is your lake. Uh, but on the other hand, being realistic, uh, some some problem lakes just need a tweak, you know, they'll be there. And other lakes you really will never get there, so that doesn't become a priority. Um, you know, you waste a lot of money. Uh, there is a, probably a way to prioritize and, uh, such that you get delisting occurring fairly rapidly and you're meeting within a few years, in some cases, you can be meeting standards when you were meeting standards before. And over a 10 or 20 year period, you can do that in a very systematic way and, and make a lot of progress rather than doing dabbling a little bit here, a little bit there, everybody follow the same rules. So is there really a, that was a long one today. I knew you knew all this, but these you know, if you're on the same page. Is there really a, a hunger for that or is that behind the sky? Well, I, I think there is. Whether there's the political will to do that, I don't know. Because I mean, I think also in addition to impaired and lakes that just need a tweak, there are there are realistically lakes that are more important to us in Minnesota than others. Um, you know, just think of deep water lakes, for example, are probably more important, a more important resource here in the state than than some other lakes. So I think that's possible. It'd be possible to prioritize those. What and I, I think that could be done. Whether it could be done politically or not, we'll we'll see soon. I have my doubts about the political reality of that one, frankly. So. Jim, uh, you mentioned you had a. Uh, 
stakeholders interaction and in light of your uh, one of the priorities keeping the water of the land um, did you have any interaction with the farmers and how did that yet um, yes, we did. So the, the farm organizations, I would say, were represented in those meetings. For farm Bureau, uh, Farmers Union, corn growers, soybean growers. Um, they were at some of these meetings. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I really think there's a there's an ethic to do what we can to maintain and improve our waters. Uh, I think they're receptive. There, there was no significant pushback at those meetings from those groups so so i think that's beneficial and i think um i, I think it's heartfelt and i believe that they they um, have the same kind of interest in in the resources of the state as everyone else does thank you sure yeah so you mentioned that the governor's budget isn't out yet the commission doesn't have any of its own funding and it may not exist um, further down the road. Um, and my attention is drawn to the idea that these broad issues the commission recommends for legislative action, but recommendations are not prioritized. And I was wondering if you could comment as to why that seemed like the best course of action and whether that would affect how much funding gets thrown there in the future um, when when these are brought to the legislature? And um, why they weren't prioritized? Yes, uh, I think I think they're so broad in scope that it's difficult to prioritize. You know, they're they're so different in in what they what they involve and the resources they need. It's hard, and and then well, realistically, I'm, I think if we prioritize those, then the bottom half would have just been thrown away so okay. so um, uh, I'm not we didn't go we didn't go in depth in that there probably was a way to prioritize those but uh, frankly I think that would have just taken the bottom half of the, the list off off the playing field mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with regards to the um, statewide water policy um, is there any thought to like resurrecting the um, conservation plan that was developed and you mentioned it in your talk and using that as a kind of starting point for that policy? That would that would be the place to start, I believe. Um, I you know I think this will if it goes forward, it'll be done by the, the Environmental Quality Board will do that uh, in coordination with the agencies and were they not to use that document. I mean that would that would be the foundation I think where that ought to begin. It's it's the best piece of work we have up, I think, to, to, to put all the issues together. Paul? You said that at the beginning there were about 100 or 200 water-related bills going through the House and Senate now. Well, are these 13 priorities um, uh, representative in those couple hundred bills that are being introduced, or are they like on totally mm -hmm. different topics? Um, so the way it works is that they, you get a sponsor in both houses and they're, they're called, they're put in a jacket, which is a folder and then they're laid on the table in the chambers. Um, so now there are 1500 or so of these in each chamber, um, about a hundred in water. The water ones cover the gamut. The bulk of them are a tweak to a lake through the bonding fund or something, you know, um, uh, an effort for a particular small lake or or a stream restoration or something that's in most of them are backyard backyard bills. Mm -hmm. Most of them, um, most of them aren't far reaching in or statewide in their context. So do you have to get the interest of a particular senator or representative to take one of these things and champion it? Is that kind of way? Oh works? yeah. Yeah, if, otherwise it never gets introduced. So um, without somebody, and and frankly, without uh, in the Senate, without having bipartisan support, <coughs> excuse me, but I won't go anywhere. <coughs> so unless you have a, a Republican and a Democratic senator on the bill, <coughs> they um, 
they might not go anywhere, or at least if you have a Democratic senator on the bill, it might not go anywhere. Um, being in a room with people who I suspect would be excited to work on some of these projects, uh, would you foresee or um, what would be your bet about the job creation if the inevitable projects that you go through in the funding of that? Well, I think the job market for water scientists is it will be good, is pretty good, will be good. I don't think these bills in and of themselves um, will provide a lot of funding to the agencies. But the clean water, the, the money really comes from the clean water fund. <clears throat> Are you a Minnesota person or? I am not. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the driver really is the clean water land and legacy fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, the monies from that fund um, support much of the work that's done. Um, that's probably going to, it's 10 years old now. So, uh, and it's a 25 year amendment. Um, I think things will move. Uh, if, if you, I believe things, will, they've sort of been in a uh, monitoring, measuring stage for much of the last of this decade, assessing, and it's going to move to implementation. So, the focus of the funding is going to move to doing things on the land and with uh, local units of government for the most part. So, I think that's where the job market will be. Um, maybe not as much with the agencies as with. Um, the watershed districts and the counties and the people that implement those plans. So, so I, I really think that's where the growth in the market will be. Yeah. I was curious because I saw a lot of the recommendations had things about including collaboration between state agencies <clears throat> or legislative bodies. And I was wondering if that was kind of in response to the fact that some of those agencies are siloed on some of those issues, or just more about <clears throat> collaboration and some of the new pilot programs and things. Well, you know, I think looking back, um, the Clean Water Act has done a lot to uh, enable the agencies to work together. They, they do a pretty good job. They're still siloed, but I think they do a really good job of, of coordinating among the agencies. Um, could be better, I suppose. Or, there's often a bill to abolish all of them and combine them into one super water agency that comes around frequently. Uh, I don't know that that's a solution to, to state management of water programs. Um, but I, I think they work pretty well together and, and they're referenced because many of these things involve several of the water agencies in the state. You mentioned uh, about uh, some of the information, like we have a legislative commission on Minnesota resources, which are for the water uh, quality board, and now we have water commission, and I'm sure there are other commissions too. How does they work with you, and what the overall <clears throat> what this commission does compared to the other? Yeah, so the, the differences are that, uh, so the water commission really deals with bills in the legislature. Mm -hmm. Um, the Clean Water Council deals with the funds that they get from the legacy amendment to, for the most part, to provide uh, additional programs to the agencies. Uh, the LCCMR, which is related to the lottery dollars, they fund projects um, by a variety of entities. Um, Clean Water Council really deals with things that are habitat related. So they all have their place. Um, and and um, you know they work together, but it could, that could be better. I met with the Clean Water Council folks this morning, and we talked about that. And they should be could be working better together, I think. Um, but they all do have their own their own missions and own sources of funds that that kind of regulate what they do. There. In the, in the report, and I may misremember this. I'm just correct me if I'm wrong. I saw um, almost nothing about research and being a researcher, many people in this room. You know, I, I think that we can do things more effectively, faster, better uh, by thinking of new things rather than trying to do things that we did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. or so. and, and it, um, but is that, you know, I think among legislators, research is uh, one uh, who actually very uh, liberal Democrat, most commonly from the United States. Research is like pouring money down a rat hole. 
you know, and, and uh, is how do we reverse, how do we change that? Uh, I mean, I understand legislators, you know, a lot of them are lawyers, at least the, the culture is that of you know, lawyers. And you win, one guy wins and one guy loses. And then it's over. You know, and you don't do that with management. I mean, it's not that, uh, really so much the way it's done. But um, how do we change that? I mean, you're a researcher, you know, red letter research operation for many years. And, uh, I don't know that I have the answer, you know, your comment about for mostly lawyers. I've learned uh, in the last that that they're mostly not. And um, maybe the, some of the the metro representatives and senators are lawyers, but for the most part, if you think about the job, um, they work five months a year, they make $45,000. Um, most of them are Retired teachers, there are people who own real estate agents, agencies or insurance agencies that that allows them to have the ability to take not many teachers because teachers can't take five months off in the winter to come to St. Paul. Uh, so most of them really aren't lawyers. Um, but your point about research is well founded and and I don't know that I I, I think I think you're in the impression of the value of research in the legislature is not not strong enough. Um, and I think that's partly because of who they are and what their constituents tell them. And I don't know what the solution to that is. I mean, there are things like the LCCMR, Clean Water Funds, that support some research, but bills to um, foster research are, are, I think, hard to pass. At the same time, though, um, you know, the legislature has funded a lot of positions in CCAMs recently. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those positions are directed at some of these same needs here. I mean, so we have to give them credit for that. Yeah. 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 I think the soil health position is a good one, but that, that really came through the Clean Water Council Fund. So mm -hmm. not, a, not a legislative act, um, but hopefully now they'll you know, they'll see the significance of continuing to fund that. I think one of the weaknesses, and it's not, you don't have to answer either, but one of the things I think can be greatly improved in research and make it more powerful uh, and useful is uh, we do we do really good at publishing papers in like Paul <laughs> in general, but um, we do a pretty lousy job for the most part. Partly because the agencies don't require to expect it in the translational element. I mean, going from a really good idea to implementation with all the uh, regulatory framework goes around that and all that um, isn't it's not expected and it's not done yet. We don't do it for free, you know, uh, and it's not expected, so it never gets done. And there's, I think, many times when you kind of Good ideas are coming out of the university, but they've never been implemented because, or are very, very slow to be implemented. Uh, because we uh, actually don't expect them to be somehow. You know, you know there, there, really, there really isn't even a good forum for research people to come talk to legislators. legislators. They, yeah, would be I mean, you know, there's there's county day and township day and city day and every other kind of day there. Um, gun day and whatever whatever kind of day you want um there's a day for it. and they're they're marching through the uh the house in particular in droves uh, and they have an audience but there's nothing i don't want to believe nothing science. like that for science day. there's water day um but you don't want to be a researcher that seems so closely associated with a politicized group a special interest group that's well the science community in it of itself you know and the, if they had science day and there is water day um water day is is for the most part uh, citizens who are concerned about water and there's no component there this is what the university is doing i think would be a good thing um the problem is during the session, it's hard to get their attention, and when the session's not in place, they're not there. So, <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not sure how you do that. I think you know, field trips, um, 
is one way for for groups like this commission. That, uh, we better yeah. Yeah. one more question. Satish. I, I'm just, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that there's no mechanism for the pressure training for some of the state agency folks. <coughs> new techniques coming, new ideas coming in. Have you guys thought about how they can be updated? They learned the same old stuff from us a long time ago. And <laughs> They're all from the University of Minnesota. Yeah, right. Okay. Some of them. <laughs> Yeah, that that's a good point. I don't see the legislature doing that, but but um, you know, I think the in the Dayton administration there was a Hannah Henderson was the water advisor to the governor, and that would be the kind of person that probably should come here and talk to you. Um, and that's where that question ought to go. So within the agencies, what do they do for continuing education? What kind of funds do they allocate for that? My understanding is there is no position like that in, in the Waltz administration. So that's that's unfortunate because I don't know, I'm maybe new in Anna, but she was, I thought, quite good. So that's unfortunate, I believe. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. That's okay. That's all right. Good. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Yeah, nice to see you. I don't know. They won't care about it. I'd like to see it continue. Thank you. Thank you.